Ten years ago, a day like this marked a new dawn for Kenya. The new constitution gave birth to 47 devolved units. We have a new constitution. What the violence here 2007-2008? Now you to na sema you and Wongom Tupu na na sisi kama wakati wa wasingishu to meishi pa moja to meowana. The connection that the public has made between killing uh, suspected criminals um, and their own safety is also completely understandable. And it is a reflection of the fact that the justice system where all these solutions are supposed to be provided is not currently providing solutions. Kenya. A nation 57 years on from independence has realized great change, but not without contradiction and controversy. Gang patronage by politicians has allowed criminal enterprises to flourish, and the murky line between gangs and politics has undermined state responses to the issue, making it harder to counter. A new report from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime paints a picture of inequality and profit-seeking criminal enterprises that have become deeply embedded into the fabric of society. You're listening to Africa and the Global Illicit Economy from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. This week, we're in East and Southern Africa. I'm your host, Lindim Tongana. Political collusion with gangs has a long history in Kenya. Post-independence, youth wings were used to confront opposition parties at campaign rallies. The 1990s brought with it a shift towards multi-party democracy, opening the door for greater political competition. In the face of rapid urban growth and youth unemployment, the state retreated from investing in public infrastructure and accelerated the use of youth gangs in politics. But once election cycles ended, so did the benevolence of political patrons. Unemployed youth looking for a form of income turned to organized crime and became the gatekeepers of public services that rapidly urbanizing public spaces needed most. GI research published in the Politics of Crime, Kenya's Gang Phenomenon, uncovers the development of gangs, politics and organized crime. During the 1990s, there was a politician, David Mwenye, who was on and off MP for Embakasi Ward, which is a sprawling settlement east of Nairobi Center. And Mwenye actually competed for the MP seat under the banner of many different political parties. Around the same period in the 1990s, Embakasi became the territory of a violent criminal gang known as Jeshila Embakasi. And the allegation is essentially that Mwenye appears to have recruited the men who formed this gang in the run-up to the 1992 campaign for the MP seat in order to help him contest that election and many subsequent campaigns. Simone Hasem is a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. The report draws on numerous testimonies from men who were members of this gang about how the Jeshi disrupted the rallies and meetings of his opponents and discouraged rivals by burning their homes or businesses or even murdering them, and how Jeshi members viewed Mwenye as their political godfather. Now, in return for playing this role in campaigns, it's alleged that Jeshi Lai and Bakiasi members were paid directly with cash or in kind with alcohol, food, or cigarettes, but that they also received parcels of land. They occupied that land, which enabled the politician in question to sell them off, which became a lucrative business. So this kind of partnership was formed around help in election times and then uh, access to an urban resource, which was land. Do organized criminal gangs and politics in modern day Kenya still have strong ties? There have been allegations during every single one of Kenya's elections that various figures had used gangs to campaign or that unnamed figures were behind the activities of a particular gang that was causing trouble in certain communities. At the same time, there's never really been any accountability for those allegations. 
And certainly the report talks about the most recent election. In fact, we have a case study looking at a particular neighborhood in Mombasa where there have been repeatedly and in reference to a variety of would-be politicians and successful politicians who've competed for the seats there that they've used gangs and in particular had played a very catalytic role in the establishment of particular youth gangs in Mombasa. And these allegations aren't, aren't secret. Various high-ranking police officials, in fact, made public statements alleging that this support was being given to young people to form gangs in the previous election in Mombasa. But these tend to rest at the level of allegation, aspersions cast on unnamed figures. It's You often hear talk about political figures being linked to gangs. You very rarely hear of a particular political elite figure being arrested or closely questioned about their relationship with a gang. <laughs> Kumara and Karuhia villages in Karatina were engulfed in clouds of sorrow following the brutal murder of 29 residents by alleged Mungiki sect followers. Mungiki, one of Kenya's most influential criminal organizations, was founded in the 1980s to protect farmers in land disputes. As years went on and Nairobi's urban spaces expanded, so did the group's criminal affiliations. Some called them a gang, others called them a religious group. In any case, Mungiki was banned in 2003, but interviewees contest that remnants of the group have moved to licit economies. Mungiki is an example of the broad definition of gangs in Kenya and how that affects the policing of organized criminal groups. Organs of the state will announce that X many number of gangs have been banned. and. This gives the impression that the state understands and is monitoring the gang phenomenon. But ultimately, we argue that the periodic cataloging exercises are of limited value and probably almost entirely a distraction. How do gangs collude with police officers? And how has this played a role in gang presence in Kenya's major cities? This is a phenomenon that's repeatedly reported by by communities, by police officers themselves and by gang members. In the report, we make a case study of a particular neighborhood where there was a gang operating under the protection of the local police station, essentially, and in collusion with them to occupy land and to sell it to other people. And that relationship was really crucial to their ability to function and to run that criminal business. There are many other examples of ways in which the police have provided uh, often quite selective protection to gang members. Uh, police officers talking about also being given license by superiors that had relationships with gangs to crack down on certain gangs and not other gangs. So this is a phenomenon that, that appears to be fairly widespread and also accords with the fact that the Kenyan police are, are, are seen in polls that are done of the Kenyan public as being very corrupt and uh, not very well trusted. The rapid development of Kenya's urban spaces opened new doors for criminal entities. Whereas many had relied on politicians for support, they've now become increasingly more self-sufficient, shifting the pyramid of power between gangs, the police, and political elites. The people who have the most power in the scenario are the politicians. They do form these quid pro quos with gangs, but we also see that when the gangs become too much of a liability, the politicians are able to, in effect, call on police to crack down on them. And not always. There are some gangs, which, like the Mugiki, which became large enough to more or less survive those police crackdowns. But for many other gangs, their careers have ended in police killings. I think it's the elite that really holds the cards in this situation, rather than the gangs themselves. So what needs to be done to address Kenya's gang issue? The overarching conclusion from the report is that elites need to be held accountable for the violence that they enable. And that's easier said than done, but no less necessary for being obvious and difficult. For democracy, combating organized crime is intimately tied to the struggle to maintain, protect, or strengthen democratic institutions. So it's an extremely important problem. But finding effective and feasible solutions is extremely difficult. We've suggested five recommendations. We think that there should be a greater monitoring of the run-up to elections, and not just the day of polling that people who use coercive tactics and who use violence as part of their campaigns to be named and shamed. 
as an overarching recommendation, we really recommend that political and developmental solutions to the rise and resilience of organized criminal gangs are pursued and a step back is taken from strong on crime rhetoric we don't believe is delivering good results. We've also highlighted the role of the media, which has a very crucial role in defining issues of organized crime and investigating corruption and crime and in highlighting the root causes, including the socioeconomic drivers of gang violence. And that's a role that it needs to be supported in. We talk about also the huge importance of improving formal service delivery in Nairobi and Mombasa to close the space for organized criminal gangs to exploit poor provision. Again, this is a tricky problem because a lot of people working closely to improve those services would say that one of the main obstacles is criminal capture. But certainly they, at the very least, need to be understood and dealt with in tandem. Lastly, we really encourage the building of a shared picture of threats and partnerships between civil society and government. And I think the role of civil society organizations in Kenya in, for example, um, highlighting the rate and presence of extrajudicial killings has been very important in, in understanding what's going on and what the impact is. And we believe that there are a range of other threats in the illicit economy that could also be monitored, such as extortion, the extent and the prices, gang control and operation. And this would provide an evidence base that could perhaps lead to better dialogue. That was Simone Hasem, a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I live in Kenya, I live in Nairobi, and I have always known that the issue of criminal gangs is a major, major problem in Kenya. But it's so deep rooted, it's so embedded in our politics and I our political economy more than I knew. I think Kenyans just don't know how deep that is. The gangsters control the politics of this country. Uh, they control a chunk of the economy. We talk about the matatu industry, we're talking about um, the security industry, we're talking about utilities, that's power and water. So many politicians of repute have a criminal gang somewhere. And these gangs do that job for them uh, in terms of campaigning, in terms of um, even eliminating. Some might say gangs are everywhere in Kenya. According to GI Research, the growth rate of criminal gangs in Kenya has increased by 128% since 2010. At present, there are an estimated 326 gangs in the country and over 1,000 other illicit groupings organized for the provision of services. Ken Opala reveals push factors driving the growth of gangs in Kenya. There are many factors. One is the unemployment. Two is high school dropout. Three, of course, there are drugs around, talk about hard drugs. And the government has failed to arrest this problem. And another reason is that there's really a major mix between states and gangs. So what, that, what does that mean? That means that there is fertile ground for the mushrooming of the criminal gangs. Ken Opala is an investigative journalist and senior fellow at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Ken, what activities are gangs involved in? Essentially, how do they make their money? One is political mobilization. We know in Kenya, gangs provide security and protection during political campaigns and meetings, and sometimes they act as assassins for hire. They can also cause uh, post-election violence if their preferred candidate's loss. They can be used to thwart democracy. Two, they are also involved in the criminal activities such as drug trafficking, trade in illicit guns, robbery, collection of illegal levies, mostly in the poor residential areas where administration is absent. What they do is that they fill the void in the profession of services such as the garbage collection, and at times they act as vigilantes at a price. Three, they are involved in legal water and electricity connections at a price. Four is that um, they are also used to grab and dispose public utilities. We have seen cases where the gangs grab public land and pretend to sell it to unsuspecting buyers. And four, they are involved in public transport. In Kenya, we call them matatu. Matatus are privately owned minibuses that serve as the primary mode of transport for much of Kenya's populace. They emerged in the 1980s to fill gaps in the lack of public transport for a rapidly growing country, essential and indispensable 
Matatus have now become hotbeds for violence and extortion. A Matatu driver recounted his experience with powerful cartels to GI field researchers. They will give you a guide on the fare. This is the amount we are charging now. To your advantage or to your disadvantage, it depends. If you do not pay up, sometimes it can get ugly because you, they will say don't walk in that route again or get out of that vehicle. Sometimes it can also get physical. So long as you do your part and they do their part, life goes on. Well, what should be clear from the outset is that in the public transport in Kenya is all private. It's privatized. So the, the taxis are owned by individuals. So what happens is that this, these gangs have formed what you call cartels, and they control what you call termini. That's the pickup point for, for passengers. So what mean means that if you have a matatu or even a taxi, you have to pay these guys to be allowed to operate from one particular termini. Anybody with a new matatu must pay, and we talk about good money, we talk about $1,000, we talk about $500 to pick up passengers from a particular termini. Let's dig a little further into that. How would you describe the relationship between gangs and politicians? One is that I've already said uh, that in Kenya, if you want to survive as a politician, you must have a gang. All politicians have criminal gangs uh, somewhere that do their bidding for them. In 2007 and 2008, post-election violence committed by politician-patronized gangs racked the nation. Mungiki played a major role in acts of displacement and gender-based violence. Ken, can you discuss the power and prominence of the Mungiki gang? It's a bit difficult to know whether it's been whitewashed or still around because gangs in Kenya keep rebranding. But this criminal gang was so bloody, was, was murderous, was so destructive. And this gang used to have uh, connections in the top echelons of government. Um, and we went to talk about a uh, top echelons of politics in 2002 and 2007. And even 2013, uh, this gang was powerful. At this particular moment, we have a gang called uh, Gaza. Gaza operates in, uh, in a part of Nairobi called Eastlands. Islands is the most populous part of Nairobi. It's made up of low to middle income groups or communities. This gang has been able to compromise even police. There's a police station within the area the gang operates whose uh, top senior police, senior police officers were at the payroll of the gang. How important is it for gangs to collude with police officers? They do protection. They protect gangs. Two, is they are able to leak information about any impeding uh, raids on gangs. And, and three, uh, police can hire out gangs or arms. And again, you find a situation where police extort from gangs and they basically will want the gangs to be there so that they can extort from them. So it means every arrest, uh, the gangs will pay some money and police will reach them. Can you describe the state responses to these organized criminal gangs? There have been uh, three attempts to ban, to ban gangs over the last 20 years, I guess, but it hasn't been uh, successful. The authorities have been trying to, to deal with gangs. One is legislation. They also been uh, this move to ban or outlaw their activities. And uh, there are times there's arrests or even extrajudicial killings of gang members. It's just, like I said, bureaucratic gesturing. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. So these bans have not helped anything. In 2007, uh, there were some reports by the, some civil societies that showed that the government had killed about 500 Mungiki gang members in the five months between June 2007 and October 2007. Uh, but despite this, uh, <laughs> there are many gangs that have come up. So the response has been a few times. That was Ken Opala, an investigative journalist and senior fellow at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. We come, they open fire. Are we supposed to run away? No, we don't run away. <laughs> we fire back. Trust me, if we don't kill these people, they will kill you. Mathare is one of Nairobi's largest slums. Zoned as a quarry during Kenya's colonial period, the community originated as a residence for Africans who were not allowed to live in the city center. 100 years on, Mathare has become an example of how inadequate access to resources fuels exploitation by gangs and police in Kenya. It's really disconcerting that after 100 years, this settlement has no systematic water provision, 
no public hospital, no high school, and it's still privy to all of the, really the diseases I see in Madari that I thought were extinct. And the only other place I saw them was in a refugee camp. It's a site of a lot of violence and a systemic disregard and systemic abdication of the provision of public services and basic services like a sewer system. And so the reason that there's a fractured provision of services, which provides a gap for cartels to come and then offer these services, is because both the colonial and post-colonial government have not worked to provide any of these services. Wangoe Kimari is an urban anthropologist and the participatory action research coordinator for the Mathare Social Justice Center. It depends on the person who has a contact or a network at the Nairobi City Water and Sewerage Company who then can provide water or someone who has a friend in Umoja or another different community who can get water to sell. And and it's I'm sure it's not news to you that poor residents of Nairobi pay four times as much for water than people who get water from the Nairobi City and Water Sewerage Company. And so really it's the... The complete disregard for neighborhoods like Madare, for Mukuru, for Korogocho, that creates the space. And so if we are to highlight the violence and the exploitation and organized crime, we need to think about the structured deficits that create the gap for this crime to come in and provide water. But at the same time, the opportunities. What does the word gang mean in communities like Madare? I'm really wary of these blanket words. Gang, gangster, thug. Because even if people use it as self description, and many, sometimes young people will say, I'm a former gangster. For me, it implicates them in, in histories and weights and has these weights of history and has these connotations that are then uh, used against them. But also, I think that if we are to think about the definition of gangs, then that, that definition encompasses even our leadership and government. If it's more than three people keen on pursuing criminal intent, then that really captures a lot of people, political parties. So I'm really wary about that word, but also because criminal, what can be criminal is the fact that these communities or these spaces exist. And for me, that's the biggest crime that the county can be okay to have 200,000 people uh, with maybe 250,000 people sharing maybe 2,500 water points, you know? And so that's why I'm, I'm wary about that word. That said, I would say that I don't actually, and I'm not, again, I'm not a Madari resident, but in my over a decade there, I never hear really the use of the word gang. Even if the Swahili word is also genge, I don't hear the word gang or genge that often. The words I hear are like youth groups, bases, CBOs, uh, which unfortunately, and as your report also shows, there's a lot of conflation between these groups and gangs. Do you think members of the community distinguish between organized criminal groups that offer access to services versus those that actually rob and steal? I would say, of course, community distinguish between groups that have what you can say is a monopoly of creating insecurity. For sure, they're the groups that they may offer this service, but they can also create insecurity. There's that distinction, but there's also the recognition that there's very grounded ways of conducting oneself. These formations that we call gangs may say, in this community, which is ours, we don't steal. We make sure there's no crime. So they, even if they may con- have conduct crime somewhere else within their community. They also they enact situated codes of conduct, which really make it difficult to say this group steals and this group doesn't. Or this group is violent and this group is not violent. And I, I think also for me, what we don't emphasize enough or think about enough is that many, there are many crime for the most part, from my experience, is enacted by individuals who seize opportunities to just a particular moment. The fact that we have so many cases of rogue officers being able to eliminate Kenyans and continuing to work within a system undetected is what is the concern of Kenyans. We, we, we understand that we're not condemning each and every police officer um, with a blanket con- condemnation, but we are very worried that a system exists that 
appears to tolerate the existence of cells that carry out these acts. In communities like Mathare, extrajudicial killings are utilized as a method to root out gangs. Coupled with an unofficial shoot-to-kill approach, countless members of the community have died from stray bullets and cases of mistaken identity. First, I think, you know, these historical narratives of poor people that you live in Madare, so you must be a criminal or a sex worker or a rapist. I think because these are narratives that are decades long, are entrenched not only in media spaces, but in literature, uh, then it becomes easy to say, ah, whatever I, as a police officer, whatever I do in this community, I can be vindicated because this is a, a site of criminals and everyone knows that. So the problem is, these narratives exist and then legitimate hyper-policing, legitimate like extra legal acts by the police. So that's one thing, uh, that these narratives justify that. But at the same time, there's no hard and fast boundary between police and criminals or police and gangsters, really, if we are to use that word. Police turn a blind eye to crime a lot. In Madare, the cash crop that people say that not only has fed and schooled so many people, but also really in many ways also endangered a lot of the communities. Changa, which is illegal alcohol. The police pick up taxes every week for Changa in front of our passing by our office, you know? So there's no, it's not that there's this ambiguity affects policing, is that policing are super interested in this ambiguity and there's no effective, hard and fast boundary between crime and the police. Wangoi, how does the police's shoot-to-kill approach actually affect community perceptions of the state? See, the, the vision that, for example, the MP of Madare has total power. He doesn't have total power at all. And so he, as much as maybe he will need young people to support him, they also make demands. It's not only one-sided, but I would give the example of one MCA or member of county assembly who was voted in in one Madare ward. And it's the very same people who voted her in that are saying, this woman should not come back here because we even as mothers bribed people to vote for her and she has not done anything for us, you know? And so even if she has become an elite and she's no longer there, she also needs to contend with the dynamics of the community and become accountable. And I think we need to see this, the, these collusions as not necessarily always in the favor of political elites. And for communities that are pushed against the wall, sometimes you just close your eyes and vote for this person because at the moment, this is a they can provide a service that can be rendered to the community, but their power is not total. Madare has never had, in maybe in the last 12 years, there's never been an MP that has lasted more than four years. So we also see the power of the community in shifting dynamics. What has been the Mathare community's response to organized criminal gangs and their collusion with political elites? First, I mean, you know, the first face of the state in Mathare is the police. Policing is not a public good. You know, in the last one week, I would say about a week and a half, at MSJC, or Madare Social Justice Center, we've been documenting the killings of nine young people. One literally was sitting eating a chicken leg on a stone. He, so he was shot in the leg, and when we went to bail him out, the charge would have been attempted robbery with violence. So part of what we are struggling with is this narrative that people just take for granted as the truth. That brands many young people as criminals. I believe that since we have a forum where in parliament and in government where we can discuss the policy, the administrative and the, and the legal issues in parliament, that can be interrogated in that process. Many. Let's just get to the beats of some of the key things he talked about, um, delaying the referendum and, you know, holding it together with the general election um, instead of a yes or no, breaking it down to a number of questions, um, the taking time to build consensus. On 9 August 2022, Kenya citizens will elect the nation's next president. 
Simone Hasem divulges what the public might expect in the lead up to the polls. Campaigning will start well in advance of the poll. And people who live and work in slum areas expect to start seeing a rise in political gang activity in 2021. And quite simply, if you look at the history of the use of gangs and campaigns, uh, the use of violence and coercion and intimidation has actually been very effective for a number of candidates. It's helped people win seats. And at the same time, the phenomenon has become somewhat normalized and there's never accountability. So why not use a gang if you're an aspiring politician and you think you can get away with it in certain communities, which you almost certainly can, in part because those communities are poor and marginalized and have less resources to resist that kind of malign politicking. Amid calls for constitutional reform, Ken Opala reveals that politicians supported post-election violence is a possibility. Given that gangs have played a really destructive role in elections in the past, uh, the 2022 elections won't be different. But Wangoi Kimari emphasizes that community organizing rather than violence should be the focus. The work of so many youth groups and justice centers and civil society organizations and mothers and community health workers who are making sure that there will be no violence and that there will be no danger and that their kids would be well. And so for me, my plea is that we f- we give more life to this and we focus more on this rather than possible violence between gangs and police, because I think this really requires our efforts and our thoughts. In Kenya's rapidly urbanizing environment, Elites, politicians and gangs benefit from inequality. In the absence of public services, this pyramid of power utilizes organized crime to fill gaps left by the post-colonial government. Communities navigate their relationship with criminal enterprises carefully, recognizing their benefit but aware of exploitation. In the lead-up to Kenya's 2022 elections, Gangs funded by politicians may play a role in coercion and fear, but community groups are already mobilizing to support a peaceful election process. That concludes this episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Thank you to our guests, Simone Haysom, Ken Opala and Wangwe Kimari. For more on this episode, visit globalinitiative.net and read The Politics of Crime, Kenya's Gang Phenomenon. You can also listen to last week's podcast on changing trafficking dynamics in North Africa and the Sahel. Please take the time to leave a review, subscribe and share the podcast on social media. It helps us get noticed and improve the show. When you hear from us again in two weeks, we'll be in North Africa. Until next time, this podcast was produced by Alexandria Sahai-Williams. I'm Lindim Tongana. Thanks for listening.